uh, let me welcome everyone. We have uh, folks from uh, Honduras, the mission in Honduras, uh, as well as folks from the United States, uh, many from the North Texas Conference, uh, which is uh, where I reside, but um, folks from other conferences and parts of the United States as well. So welcome to all of you. Um, as we move along, there may be an opportunity for us to <laughs> share a bit more about uh, where we come from and uh, our own stories. <clears throat> but I do wanna um, use our time well and be sure that we focus on the, on the mission in Honduras today. Uh, we have a couple of hours set aside for this summit. Um, and uh, before I get into the agenda and then introduce uh, the, the Bishop of the North Texas Conference, but also of the mission in Honduras, let me just tell you who I am. Uh, so uh, my name is Andy Lewis. I'm a clergy person here in North Texas, and I serve here as the Director of Missions, uh, which has brought me to um, become acquainted with the mission in Honduras. Um, and I've been working uh, alongside the leaders of the mission in Honduras for a couple of years now. I love my work alongside them and my visits to the country and um, efforts to support uh, their excellent ministry. So again, uh, my name is Andy. Um, and welcome to all of you. So our agenda looks basically like this. Um, Bishop McKee will uh, begin with a, a time of opening devotion. Uh, then we'll hear from leaders from Honduras to share with us about the state of the mission. Um, after they share with us, there'll be time for Q&A. So as you lis listen, please make note of any questions you have. Uh, you can uh, write them in the chat if you like. I'll monitor that and lift them up that way. But with the size group we have here, I think we can manage unmuting ourselves and just asking our questions as we ask. Whatever you're comfortable with there is fine. Uh, depending on the time, we may take a quick break. And then uh, when we resume, we'll hear from folks in Honduras and some of our Admission Together partners. We'll talk about their experiences um, in partnership and the positive impact that those partnerships have had. Hopefully that'll be um, instructive for all of us who are engaging in these kinds of partnership relationships. Again, there'll be time for Q&A, so note your questions. And at the very end, uh, we'll cover some odds and ends uh, related to partnership, just uh, my effort to support uh, your, your work in that regard. And um, I have some news and maybe just some logistical details to kind of share. So we aim to be done no later than four. Um, we'll see We'll see how this goes. So uh, again, welcome. So uh, Bishop McKee, would you uh, begin with a devotional for us? Yes, so uh, I think we would much rather hear from, uh, from our uh, partners in Honduras, uh, uh, the clergy and the laity in Honduras, uh, the administration staff, the DS, than listening to me. So I'm gonna be very brief about this. And uh, I, I, I sort of was um, considering about what I would what I would share with you, and then I thought, you know, I, I think I want to share with you one of my favorite passages from the Gospels. It's from the Gospel of Saint Luke, in the fourth chapter, and it happens after the temptation of Jesus, and it when it's when Jesus returns to his hometown. And if there's a if there's a passage that probably captures, I think, well what the purpose of the ministry of Jesus is. It may be this one, in which he refers, of course, to the prophet Isaiah. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm reading from uh, the fourth chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and the report about him began to spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues. He was praised by everyone. And when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then Jesus rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. And then all the eyes of all in the synagogue are fixed on him. And then he began to say, today the scripture has been 
fulfilled in your hearing. You know, I think that when I sort of looking at who is before me on the screen and others who've been involved, not only in uh, in the Honduras mission, but in mission in different ways, even in the local communities around the world, that each of you probably no doubt has a purpose. The Schultz has just shared with us a few moments ago when we were sort of doing a little bantering around getting acquainted that they had done 63, am I right, Bob, 63 mission trips in other countries. I mean. Uh, so it tells you that I would think that the Schultzes have a purpose in their lives. But I would say that about each one of us who are gathered here on this call and we live it out in a different way. If I were to think about, if Jesus, for instance, were to uh, think about a mission statement of his own, he really made it in this, in this presentation or this reading from the prophet Isaiah in his hometown. And by the way, uh, when you continue to read this, this did not go over well with the hometown folk. I want you to know that, and we do know that. I mean, they were trying to throw him off of a cliff, but such, sometimes that happens when you begin to already begin to challenge or confront the powers that be, uh, the powers of the world with the power of the spirit. So we have really what Jesus's mission is. And I can't think of a better mission for any one of us than to uh, probably try to uh, not to think that we're the Messiah. I want to be clear about that. Not to believe that we're the anointed one, but certainly what he felt called to do is something he passed on to his disciples and has been passed on through the, the tradition of the Christian community for over 2000 years. What is it? To anoint, to preach the gospel, bring good news to the poor, healing, visit people in prison, and so what I'm always amazed about when I, when I go to Honduras is not is how it is that folks, that, that clergy and laity, pastors and laity can be so resilient in a very challenging world. It's not that they are um, uh, uh, challenged uh, for, for being bearers of the good news. It's just difficult. And over these last several months, what's been very difficult, none of us have been able to go to Honduras and people can't leave Honduras. And in fact, we've had to, shall we say, postpone, which is language we use in the church right now rather than cancel, uh, the annual meeting in January. And that's a challenge. But every time I go to Honduras and I'm visiting with clergy like Roberto and Orlean, or missionaries like your, your, your Lynn, uh, I, I'm just amazed, Milton, Thomas, I'm amazed at the kind of ministry that takes place in, in Honduras among people. And I always, every visit I make, whether it's to a congregation, which it happens in some, sometimes, or just the annual meeting, I'm thinking, this is a place of joy. And I think it's because people are realizing their purpose, living out their purpose in very creative and imaginative ways. We're gonna hear about that soon. We, we live in a time right now, uh, in the world. We'll, we all have similar problems just related to the pandemic, to health, to keeping people safe, to doing no harm. And so this becomes a way for us to, to remember that there's so much more that probably connects us than we can ever imagine, even across the boundaries of country or language and or the way in which we even talk about our God and Christ. So I, I, in this time in which everything is turned upside down. This turning of upside down that's going on in the culture may be exactly what Jesus and his early ministry, and certainly those early, earlier followers and the people who became the church did, they turned the world upside down as it's recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. So you and I, being a part of the church's mission in so many different ways, where the places where we live or even in a distant place uh, in Honduras, we're seeing the world getting turned upside down and that can be for the good and for goodwill. So I want to tell you that. I also want to focus on something else and that's the word today. Well, let's think about what we're going to do in our future instead of what we're going to do today. And really every time you and I are significant, we're living into this mission, this purpose of the Christ. We're really saying that today, even through our own work, through our own responsibilities, through our own faithfulness, through our own witness, through our acts of healing and whatever forms they take place today, this is really real, the spirit of the cross is coming to know. So I just wanna briefly say those few words to you and thank you again for your interest in our mission at Honduras and to our partners 
how deeply grateful we are for you as well, and those who are clergy and uh, laity in Honduras. And you know, I want you to know that, that I uh, pray for you daily. Uh, not all of you by name, some of you by name occasionally, but pray for you daily and the good work you do. Can we have a brief prayer together uh, this afternoon as we get started? Holy God, we're grateful for the, the, the mission that we share. And the mission is not just a, a mission. It is really the work of the Holy Spirit in which we all seek to, uh, to witness to who you are in our lives and how it is that a real, vital relationship with you is able to really bring about wholeness in ways that we could never imagine. I, as so many of us, are always delighted to be in each other's presence and to learn from each other and to celebrate that which you do among brothers and sisters. So for our time together and those who've gathered, I give you thanks. For it's in the name of the Christ and his spirit that I pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen. All right. So at this time, I want to uh, give the floor to our friends in Honduras uh, who are going to share with us um, about the state of the mission. And um, I believe um, uh, Milton Yovares, who is the uh, UMVIM coordinator in Honduras, uh, has agreed to translate as needed uh, for us. And so Milton, is that still uh, a good deal for you? Very good. Okay, so again, uh, um, Pastor Roberto, Thomas, Yorlin, Milton, uh, share with us about the state of the mission. Muy buenas tardes. Soy José Roberto Peña, superintendente de la misión, y me dirijo a ustedes agradeciendo a Dios la oportunidad que nos brinda de compartir uh, algunos datos sobre la misión y nuestro trabajar juntos desde sus orígenes, la obra Metodista Unida en Honduras, ha sido una experiencia de compañerismo en misión. El compañerismo con nuestros hermanos no, Metodistas Unidos de Norteamérica se ha mantenido desde el inicio hasta el presente y ha contribuido en una forma muy significativa al desarrollo histórico de la misión. Muchas son las iglesias de Norteamérica que han estado en algún tipo de relación con la misión en Honduras. Algunas por periodos cortos, pero otras por periodos más extensos. Al presente son varias las iglesias que han mantenido esa relación de compañerismo por muchos años. Roberto. ¿Sí? ¿Sí? Eh, para, para un segundo, uh, I believe, uh, yes, I believe uh, you're following Milton is uh, translating um, uh, by writing in the chat, uh, the translation, if you want to look into the chat. Okay. So, gracias, Roberto. Para decirles que está, que está. Continúo, ¿verdad? No inicio. No, continúa. Uh -huh. Gracias, Edgar. Al presente son varias las iglesias que han mantenido esa relación de compañerismo por muchos años que ha contribuido a una hermandad más estrecha entre Norteamérica y Honduras, entre congregaciones de Norteamérica y congregaciones hondureñas. Desde el inicio hemos estado juntos en misión, pero las relaciones, pudiéramos decir, que se han ido afinando y se han ido formalizando. El programa de Juntos en Misión ha sido vital en esto, dándole claridad al tipo de relación que resulta más saludable y aportando un carácter más comprometedor para ambas partes. Esto ha permitido el desarrollo de relaciones más estrechas y sólidas que contribuye al crecimiento espiritual de los involucrados, a la transformación mutua y al empoderamiento. El programa tiene impacto en el pastorado, así como en las congregaciones y aún en la comunidad en la cual pastor y congregación 
están sirviendo. El programa en sí puede ayudar al sostenimiento de nuestros pastores a programas propios de la misión y a los programas de las congregaciones locales que están en impacto. Pero debo señalar que también hay casos en los cuales la relación entre iglesias está teniendo un impacto muy notable en el desarrollo comunitario. Reconocemos y agradecemos el liderato del reverendo Patrick Friday y le recordamos en esta hora al hermano Greg Delcini y al reverendo Andy Lewis como actual coordinador del programa para Honduras. Junto al obispo Michael McKee, ellos han traído una nueva efervescencia para el programa de Juntos en Misión en Honduras. La misión en Honduras ha ido extendiéndose y madurando. Al presente contamos con 22 congregaciones ubicadas en diferentes contextos. Tenemos congregaciones en las ciudades principales, la ciudad eh, capital de Tegucigalpa, así como en San Pedro Sula, que es la capital industrial de la república, pero tenemos también congregaciones en áreas rurales de difícil acceso. Hay presencia metodista unida en seis de los 18 departamentos. El departamento con más iglesias es el departamento del paraíso, con ocho congregaciones, siete de las cuales están en el área de Dandy. No todas las congregaciones de la misión tienen compañerismo con alguna congregación de los Estados Unidos. La mayor parte de los pastores en la actualidad son hondureños, el 86%. Muchos de ellos son producto de la misma misión. Han ido avanzando en su preparación teológica, en su experiencia, y ya algunos están acercándose a la posibilidad de una cercana ordenación, lo cual es esencial para que como misión demos el próximo paso de convertirnos en una conferencia anual provisional. Damos la oportunidad al próximo compañero de Honduras que va a compartir con nosotros. Gracias, Reverend Peña. Uh, many of us are, are still reading in the chat, I think, getting completely caught up with all of your comments. Give everyone a moment to finish uh, reading in English your comments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. And Milton, thank you for your translation. I believe, uh, are there others uh, from the mission who are going to share from, uh, from your points of view? Le tocaba a Tomás, ¿no? Y <ríe> creo que es Tomás el siguiente. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. And I join with the Bishop and our superintendent in saying welcome once again. Milton, can you please help me with the PowerPoint presentation? Just a minute. Thank you.
guess COVID has affected our technology today right now. Then. <laughs> it's extra slow, but it's loading. Sorry. COVID's to blame. <laughs> Blame it on COVID. Yes. It has a it it is a it has a front and a back wide enough that it can take all the blame. So you'll just blame it on COVID. Okay. Here we go. All right. We'll make this as quick and pain painless as possible. It's coming. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Started screen sharing. All right. I have I'll begin, it. Thank you. I'll begin by introducing the staff. The first two suspects on here, I'm sure you've seen these faces already. So. I don't think there's need for any introduction. But thirdly, we have Kayla Martinez, who is our treasury assistant and accountant. And on the last, on that row, we have Edwin Stanley, who's the person that coordinates construction. So these are some of the faces that you'll see as you visit us here at the mission. Then we have Joanna Mador, who is our administrative assistant and a member of one of our congregations here in Tegucigalpa. And then we have the housekeeper, Isabel Diaz. And as I mentioned her, I covet your prayers because today she, well, she did her COVID test and it's negative, but she's a bit tired. So she's at home resting today. And we're hoping for, well, a good rest for her and she's back in with us. Then last and most important of all, we have the people that prepare the meals, Angelica Diaz and Cindy Paget. Angelica is also a member of our congregation that meets right here at the mission. So these are the people that you'll meet as you visit us in the near future. Go ahead, Mary. All right, the United Methodist Mission in Honduras, as you know, Reverend Peña has said before, is a creature of GBGM. And we expect to receive a status at next UMC General Conference somewhere between 2024 and 2025. For this, we are moving towards credentialing of pastors. This is leading you know, pastors into ordination. And we, as we become a provisional conference, we could become a United Methodist Church as well as not necessarily a UMC church. And for all of this to happen, definitely, we're, we've been working and continue to work hard towards our sustainability. Next slide. Okay. Part of our sustainability comes with Umbim teams. They partner with us to build a brighter future, you know, in con working in congregations and in partnership through the IMT program and other ways. Right now, the mission comprises of 22 congregations. We have two clinics and a school. Re repeating a bit of what Rarantania has said before, we work mostly in the rural areas. But at the same time, we're trying to be intentional on developing work in metropolitan areas. There is a new congregation that started in Tokoa, which we will hear more about when Pastor Orling speaks to us. And I thank you. Thank you, Thomas. So it's, uh, who, who will share next? Is that your Lynn? Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. 
Muy bien, um, mi nombre es Jorlen Jiménez, eh, soy la directora de programa, eh, inicié asignación en febrero del 2020, este año, y eh, empezamos pandemia en marzo de este año, así es que no conozco Honduras y no conozco ni siquiera Tegucigalpa mucho. He estado en cuarentena. Um, el objetivo de la dirección de programa básicamente es poder consolidar un programa eh, estructurado para el desarrollo congregacional de la iglesia local. Lo que implica um, el acompañamiento a los pastores y a los líderes laicos en el entrenamiento y el desarrollo de conocimientos básicos para la implementación de los programas en, en sus iglesias. Ah, dentro de ello, prioritariamente tenemos el robustecimiento de la escuela dominical eh, y sobre todo programas en la línea educativa. Es importante mencionar que el 60% de las congregaciones, eh, de, de la membresía en las congregaciones, eh, lo componen niños y, y, y jóvenes. Por eso es que creemos que es importante robustecer este tipo de programa. Ah, con, con la venida de la pandemia eh, tuvimos que cambiar eh, el plan e implementar un plan con, de contingencia para poder trabajar de manera virtual y básicamente atendimos dos grandes necesidades. Uno a lo interno básicamente fue uh, cómo podríamos acompañar a los pastores eh, durante la pandemia y cómo podríamos continuar con el trabajo pastoral. Y otro, otra necesidad hacia lo externo, eh, cómo podríamos responder a las necesidades de la comunidad, de las comunidades donde tenemos insertas las congregaciones. En este sentido, eh, iniciamos el trabajo virtual como el, el resto de las iglesias en, en el mundo a partir de la pandemia, eh, tratando de usar los recursos disponibles que tenemos en, en comunicación y comenzamos básicamente eh, con el uso del Zoom como plataforma. Sí, sí quiero mencionar que esto fue un reto, eh, no, no es fácil Lógicamente por las condiciones que tenemos en Honduras, tenemos dificultades en conexión, tenemos tecnologías muy limitadas, eh, poco conocimiento del uso de este tipo de recursos, hay dificultades económicas y lógicamente hay también mucha resistencia y miedo con el uso de este tipo de, de tecnologías. Pero hemos podido concretar desde el mes de, ma de mayo la mesa de trabajo que es, un, es propiamente del, de la dirección de programa eh, y desde mayo tenemos reuniones semanales con todos los pastores, con el cuerpo pastoral, para acompañarles en los diferentes eh, temas que pueden ir surgiendo. Eh, recordemos que la, las iglesias, los templos permanecen cerrados eh, y un poco guiarlos en el, el trabajo pastoral que podemos hacer de manera virtual. Esto acompañado de algunas otras actividades como estudios bíblicos, eh, servicios ocultos en línea y capacitaciones o entrenamientos de parte de los misioneros eh, de la oficina regional. Dentro de lo que hemos estado haciendo y reforzando es el cuidado pastoral, básicamente que depende mucho de las llamadas y de las visitas, lógicamente con las medidas de bioseguridad. ¿Por qué llamadas? Porque las comunidades no tienen acceso a otros medios más eh, sofisticados, ¿verdad? Pero las personas no tienen smartphone, no tienen internet. Entonces, ha sido la llamada telefónica el medio que hemos podido poder cuidar eh, a las personas. Eh, y eso es un poco, como ustedes pueden ver, lo que hemos estado haciendo 
en estos tiempos, este año que ha sido un año difícil. Por otro lado, la dirección de programas ha estado trabajando en la creación de, de base de datos eh, con la, nuestra misionera eh, Amanda, eh, que es experta en, en, en esta área, pues hemos estado aprovechando y estamos creando bases de datos sumamente importantes para el procesamiento, guardar datos, procesar datos para la toma de decisiones futuras. O sea, que creemos que eso es un área muy importante. Y dentro del objetivo externo que les mencionaba, eh, apoyar a nuestras iglesias, sobre todo con el apoyo de alimentos. Eh, sabemos que la economía en todos los países se ha visto impactada, pero en Honduras mucho más, porque las economías de la mayoría de las familias es una economía, economía del día a día y sí se vio seriamente afectada. Eh, familias quedaron totalmente desempleadas sin ningún tipo de ingreso. Y lógicamente eso golpea la parte de adquisición de alimentos. Entonces, para nosotros fue de verdad un, un gusto y, y una bendición poder llevar alimentos a las comunidades. Y acá un poco, para que nos, ilustre, nos pueda ilustrar la experiencia que tuvimos de distribución de, de alimentos en las diferentes comunidades. Ah, Quiero agradecer de verdad todo, todo el apoyo que han estado brindando a Honduras, eh, el interés que han mostrado y recordarle lo que dice Hebreos 6.10. Bueno, nuestro Dios no es un Dios injusto para olvidar el trabajo de amor que hemos hecho en su nombre y a los que le servimos. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Jorlen. Cool. Uh, Pastor Edgar, are you are you uh, planning to share as well? Yes, I think. <laughs> yeah, you want me to? I'll go ahead. Um, Whoever's next. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I'll, um, I'll, I'll do it. Um, can, can I have um, rights to? Yeah, okay, you did. Sorry. Where is the document? Okay. What's going to happen here? 30 seconds. Okay, I find what disappeared. Gotcha. Okay. Um, the, the priorities for global ministries in in regards to the um mission in honduras uh, continue to to be more more or less the same uh, uh, some of you have seen this before uh, my colleagues already spoke to uh, most of most of them so i won't stop maybe i'll just make a very uh, brief comments around them um, but uh, the the goal is to become a, a provisional conference uh, that will re, uh, will by discipline uh, require to have at least ten elders and being able to sustain a budget uh, uh, for at least fifty percent. And uh, we um, we are working. Uh, they are working, the mission is working diligently towards that. Um, the, the North Texas Annual Conference has been very supportive uh, from, from different angles, certainly, but uh, Bishop and some partner churches and leadership like Andy, but also the, the board on the order ministry accepted to be our corresponding annual conference for, for the purpose of credentialing. 
and they've been very, very supportive and uh, very uh, insightful. Uh, they um, they appointed a person to to bridge and have um, worked with us in setting the uh, requirements and and the the credentialing process, the uh, parameters on training and so on and so forth. And we're we're very excited about the advancement. Um, we we definitely feel we will have a first class uh, uh, for uh, ordination of local elders in mission in uh, 2021. Um, the, the one one highlight of, of the of the priorities I will say, and of course priority number five is the approval of provisional elders. In, right now it's actually approval of, of local elders admission. So I will, I will highlight that. Um, another, another thing that I wanted to share with you is, um, let me close this up. And, um, the, the collaboration that uh, the regional office for Latin America and the Caribbean Flow ministry that the missionaries assigned into the the regional office have have also offered. We have um, one missionary regional missionary working with children at risk, and we have another missionary working with low migration, and we have another missionary working on um, congressional development and leadership development. And the three of them have been very working very closely with with the mission mostly through Jorlin's office. So they've been, um, I, I'm very grateful with, with my colleagues in, in, in the last years, last year, last, last two years, their particip participation has been very instrumental. Um, and the final highlight um, is that uh, precisely your your land did not mention it, but let me share that part. The last highlight um, is that uh, the because of of programming needs, uh, the the programming office been working by by clusters, by regions, and. Um, as, as Roberto mentioned, uh, as Reverend Pe Peña um, me me mentioned, document back, um, there are 22 congregations um, see in, cover in, in, in six of the 18 states or departments and um, here you have the geography of the of the of the country, and so we have presence in six, right? Um, so the one highlight is the we are working with with bishop in regionalizing the work in uh, formalizing the regions or districtizing, if if I may. Uh, uh, formalizing the the regions um, in in those three regions north central and east as Roberto mentioned most of the congregations are located in El Paraíso and um, um, but we're we're hoping um, that by 2021 we will have formalized uh, these regions and work um, regionally, programmatically, and many other ways. So help us God with that new, new system. And um, finally, I, I would like to uh, take the opportunity, the, the, the privilege, given that um, Roberto is um, also a global missionary, Roberto, 
I will be retiring this year after 20 years of service. Um, more, he's, he's been, he's been uh, working with the mission for more than 20 years, for sure. Because he, he came first as a volunteer of the Methodist Church in Puerto Rico, and then um, 20 years as a global ministry missionaries, he will, um, at the end of the month of January, will be retiring and remaining in, in the country. So we will continue having um, he, the blessing of, of his uh, comradeship and brotherhood and the blessing of his uh, hermandad. Blessings. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Edgar. On behalf of everyone, uh, Roberto, thank you for your ministry. Are there, are there others uh, from Honduras? Milton, were you hoping to share as well? I think we've heard from everyone from Honduras except for you. Yes. Um, let me share my screen. Well, hello everyone. Sorry, I haven't um, greet everyone by name, but um, I've seen some familiar faces. Um, just wanted to say hello to to you all. And um, so this will this is my presentation for um, so you can have information about what we do in terms of teams and of course uh, something to mention. Um, it's that everything or most mostly everything has changed um, since March, of course. Um, so we're still in the process of changes, um, constant changes. Um, we still don't have everything figured out in terms of, of teams. because uh, we, we work with a, a lot of agencies um, such as governmental and churches and uh, the superintendent office, the mission office. And so we have to like have a lot of uh, compatibility in, in all of the parties involved. And so, welcome to the VIM area or part. This is the, the team that um, it's almost like working with us not full time, of course, uh, mostly when, when we have teams. And probably, I know that some of you have uh, come here uh, with teams and some of you have not yet. So, but when you come, these are the, the phases that you'll probably see when, when you arrive. These are like the first phases you'll, you'll see. And we have, um, of course, myself, and then we have Carla and Jorge and, um, and Maritza, that they are always part of the staff. Uh, it's translating and leading teams. And when when we have multiple teams in country, then we, we go separate ways and and stuff. And these are the the medical staff that work uh, along with me and, and the teams, um, because of course we do a lot of medical uh, brigades around the country. Um, so we have to work with hand, hand by hand with uh, the governmental staff and um, also with private um, or independent hired doctors, professionals that we have to work with so we can, so we're able to have a, a medical team. Um, this is a little bit of like where, where, we, where we go and um, where do we serve? And as you can see, um, we serve anywhere within the Honduras territory. Uh, we're not limited. Um, if, if we're invited for an opportunity to engage in serving mission, then we go. Um, 
And this is a, an interesting uh, pictures because uh, we were having multiple teams during that time. So it was really unique and very special to see one team putting together the things for the team that was coming after them. So it was a, a very nice uh, dynamic uh, to see. And I thought it was nice to, to share it with you. Um, who can serve and, and how do we serve? Uh, we welcome volunteers of any background that have a heart to serve. And you can see a picture there in, that was in Subirana uh, with one of the pastors that leads um, the teams that go there in Subirana. And how do we serve? We serve in partnership. Um, we involve uh, and work with the local community as much as we can um, as a way to show them that we are there to walk with them and encourage them that they're also team members and who can join and do good for their own community. Unfortunately, in this picture, um, the, the patient that it's there had a nice moment and a nice experience that I thought it was uh, good to share with you. Um, the ways we do ministry through, yeah, it's, it's, these are some, it, we're not uh, limited just to those. Uh, of course, we, as we listen, the kind of ministry that people want to do, then we try to match according to the needs of the communities. And um, in, that's why we say in constant communication with pastors and, and uh, their communities and other organizations that we work with uh, and in, in regards of teams. So you can see uh, these are the type of work that we do, uh, medical and, uh, and other type of work. Um, these are pictures that you can see of the different teams and the different projects and activities we have in, around the country. Some of them are in Subirana and others in Cihuatepeque, in Potrerios in Tegucigalpa, in Ciudad España. Um, it's, it's a lot of locations to name them all, but just so you can have an, an idea. Um, these, are, these are also another um, experiences that we have uh, with groups. And that will be my presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, and hope to see you guys um, sometime soon when the quarantine is suspended and we're, we're all able to travel and, and work together. Milton, thank you. Um, I, was, uh, I believe that wraps up the presentations from leaders in Honduras. And I want to mention real quickly, I've received a request in the chat um, for any and all of the PowerPoints that you all put together and shared. If there's uh, a way for you to uh, send those to me, um, I would be happy to, I'll distribute them to everybody who's on the call today and those who um, were interested but unable to join us on the call today. So um, anyway, Milton, you and I can talk more about that later, but hopefully we can work, uh, work toward gathering those PowerPoints. All right, so before we take uh, maybe just a five minute stretch break, um, I do wanna create some space for your questions. Uh, so as you listened um, to the mission superintendent, um, to Thomas and Edgar and Milton and Jordan, um, did, did that raise any questions for you? Anything you'd like to hear more about? Andy, it's Holly Bandel. I'm I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about. I know we're going through a process of kind of reopening and um, engaging in more activities in person, trying to put safety things in place. And I just wondered how all of that process may be working with um, the Honduran um, churches as well.
Yeah, great question. I, I know that that Jorlen um, has has been working um, on that. I mean, they developed a, a resource uh, for the congregations and perhaps she can speak to that and Thomas. Jorlen, la pregunta, perdón. <laughs> La, la pregunta es este cómo se está viendo lo de la apertura de las iglesias y todas esas cosas y las okay. actividades que se están teniendo en la situación okay. uh, Milton vas a vas a traducir en el chat sí okay. sí, uh, sí desde mayo eh, trabajamos en una guía para las iglesias, una guía para la reapertura eh, con normas básicas para, la, para una reapertura segura eh, de acuerdo a las condiciones que el país vaya presentando y eh, es algo que hemos estado trabajando con cada pastor, eh, hemos tratado de, de acompañarlos y ofrecerles todas las herramientas eh, que puedan, que, que tengamos a mano para que ellos puedan hacer este plan para tener una reapertura segura eh, y ordenada, eh, que pueda, que no represente un peligro para las personas uh, con la apertura de los templos. Entonces, eh, es, en este momento los, al, los pastores que en sus comunidades tienen mejores condiciones de contagio o, o ha disminuido el contagio, perdón, eh, están presentando sus planes, están, los estamos revisando, los estamos retroalimentando y siendo presentados a superintendencia. Hey, Andy, before the break, I think Thomas may be answered. Thomas, you there? So is, I'm is here. okay, is COVID-19 spreading still or is it, has, has the rate of increase slowed, slowed down or what? It's still spreading. The rate of increase in some areas is becoming a bit less, but it's nationwide, it's still spreading. Which areas is it less in? But like here in Tegucigalpa, it has, it has kind of, I don't want to use the word normalized, but it, it's not spreading as fast as it was spreading. Okay. But you have places like in the Bay Islands where it's spreading like wildfire. A lot of tourists there. Well, beyond the tourists, the locals. Okay. It's, it's, it's just spreading, you know, it's, it's amazing. It's like every day it's over a hundred cases, like almost every day. Yeah. And, and Don, Don Lee and San Pedro Sula? It, like I say, again, it's still spreading, but it's like that kind of normal where we reop the country's reopening. You know, it's spreading, but not as, not as rapidly as in other areas. It's kind of down to a, a normal. Okay. That's helpful. Thanks. How much do you do you still have a, a very strict quarantine in the country like but you cannot go out actually the, the quarantine is it's slackening up because first they were doing remember one digit it all depended on the end the, your id number the ending digit they were doing one every 15 days now they they've begun to do it two per day. So we're, we have access out at least, you know, like twice, twice, almost twice in a week. And then more and more of the economy is reopening. So even though the cases are still spreading, the country is to a point where, okay, we have to, we have to find our way in this and live with the pandemic. 
because bas basically that's the message that that is being sent you know we we have to live with this we have to find a new normal and live with it thomas this the system you were describing is different than uh, what we're working with at least in texas um, could you say a little more about how that works or how that's been working where based on the the digit on your id what does that you're allowed to do on those days or what what are you not allowed to do if it's not your day how does that work yeah based on the digit, you can you can do back in person banking you can do in person banking you can go to the supermarket you can do basically anything based on the digit but one one of the institutions that is really strict when it comes to attending you according to the ending digit are the banking is, is the banking institutions some of them won't even let you go through the auto 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 teller if it's not your digit so this is what is happening but what what's happened also like the supermarkets they're not as strict anymore so you can show up any day and your temperature is taken and you go through all the biosecurity measures that they have in place and you can have free access and hours have been extended as well you know at first the curfew was until 5 p.m now it's until 8 p.m I was I was looking at the COVID cases in, in, in Honduras and they sort of let this gradual slow down like 480 new cases yesterday in the country that were reported. I mean, so they've been higher than you see sort of a in the graph that uh, the UN puts out. I think it's the United Nations or World or uh, who uh, you see this sort of gradual decline, but it then it, it goes up and down along the line. Yeah, basically we're we're learning to live with it. Okay, so uh, for the second half of our time together, the focus is going to be specifically on church-to-church uh, -church partnerships. I know that's been a, a real focus uh, for the North Texas Conference as we've entered into this relationship with the mission in Honduras. Uh, but we know that there are folks um, from other conferences who have been at this for some time. And we want to listen to them and learn from their experience. And uh, I mentioned at the beginning, as they share, if you have questions that you uh, want to ask them about, uh, about your partnership, that either that you're engaged in or at least considering getting started with, then uh, note those and um, they'll be happy to, to speak to that after their presentation. So I think first, uh, Pastor Orlean and Mike Craig are going to talk about their partnership. And again, Milton will translate as needed, I suppose. So in, in true sense of partnership, I, uh, I would defer to Orlin and let him go first. Pastor Orlin dice que empiece usted. Que les bendiga a todos. Bueno, nuestra experiencia o mi experiencia con, con la iglesia de Estados Unidos ha sido una gran bendición para la iglesia de la Ceibita y para la comunidad en general y alcanzando hasta la ciudad de Tocoa, ya que Dios nos ha permitido trabajar juntos, unir nuestras vidas para poder alcanzar a aquellos que lo necesitan. Mike es una persona que verdaderamente está pendiente de nosotros, al igual que todo el equipo Corazones y Manos. Es una relación que no solamente cuando ellos vienen a Honduras la tenemos, sino que nosotros nuestra comunicación es fluida, es semanal, muchas veces diaria. Hemos compartido buenas experiencias cuando ellos han estado con nosotros en la Ceibita. 
compartimos nuestra cultura en cuanto a comidas, eh, los involucramos en la cocina para que ellos puedan cocinar también. Hay varios proyectos que hemos desarrollado en conjunto y gracias a Dios hasta el momento todo lo planeado ha salido bien. En mejoras al templo de la iglesia, en seguir alimentando a la niñez en la ceibita con un comedor infantil que se alimentan 80 a 130 niños diarios con un almuerzo. A raíz de la pandemia no está habilitado lo que es el, el centro de alimentación, al igual que el templo está cerrado. Pero nos ayudaron con raciones de alimento que beneficiaron a las personas de la iglesia como también a las personas de la comunidad. Se entregaron más de 300 raciones a las familias en este tiempo. Gracias a, a estas personas que Dios pues, ha puesto en nuestras, en nuestras vidas, al igual que el año, el año pasado, este año, este año, se culminó un, un centro de, de inclusión para niños aquí en la ciudad de Tocoa, ya que no había un centro que atendiera a esta población necesitada. Y se ha trabajado en conjunto con la iglesia de Sullivan en construir este centro. También eh, se ha ayudado con equipo al hospital de la ciudad de Tocoa, al igual que el centro de salud de la, de la Ceibita. También se han hecho aulas, se han construido aulas en el centro de enseñanza en la Ceibita y gracias pues a, a este equipo que ha estado pendiente en las necesidades que nosotros tenemos en la comunidad y en nuestra ciudad. Ha sido de mucha bendición. Y son muchas las cosas. Al principio de esta pandemia, estuvimos, estuvimos un tiempo unidos. Eh, los hermanos allá en Estados Unidos, juntamente con, con la iglesia acá en Seibita, estuvimos en un tiempo de, de retiro espiritual, de ayuno, ayunando los unos por los otros, compartiendo la palabra de Dios, mensajes de Dios. Eh, un día, al igual que, que nosotros, pues hemos estado pendientes de, de ellos y ellos de nosotros, hemos tenido esa comunicación siempre. Y son muchas, muchas las palabras que, que puedo decir, pero sé que el tiempo es limitado. Y sé que hay muchos planes que tenemos para, para el futuro. Este año pues no fue posible desarrollar lo que es la construcción del templo en la ciudad de Tocoa debido a la pandemia. Pero es un proyecto que está en nuestra mente y en nuestro corazón desarrollarlo. Y con la ayuda de Dios, todos juntos podemos, podemos lograrlo. Pues somos un solo equipo. Tenemos una misma visión y una misma misión. Gracias, Pastor Lin. Mike, what would you like to yeah. add? Um, I'll just add a few things and just, can you hear me okay first? I think my internet may be unstable. Loud and clear. Oh, thanks. If you can hear me, smile, Milton. No, no, he is my. So I will, um, I would just like to 
address number one that Pastor Orlin has been a, a huge blessing to the church and and he's a local uh, pastor uh, from the area which has been a huge blessing and uh, we've been in partnership now I think for 11 years uh, that we've been working there but in IMT partnership only probably for the last six or seven years. Uh, one thing I think that we learned early was the more we faded back in the partnership the more God blessed uh, the mission. And as Pastor Orlin mentioned, the, um, the local church is running a feeding center, feeding up to 130 kids a day. Uh, we were able to build a special needs school uh, in the, the town of Tekoa. Uh, we're preparing to build a new church uh, where he will be a pastor there as well as in um, La Sabita. But I think the partnership aspect is important to build on. We um, we not only partner, have learned to partner better with the local church and through trust and relationship, but also with the mission, uh, with Thomas and Milton. We've grown that relationship with, with Pastor Roberto Pena. Uh, he's worked with us as well. Uh, also, one thing we don't want to overlook is partnership with the local government has paid huge dividends for us. Uh, one way that we can kind of, of help be that presence um, for the church is is to to get those relationships with the local school and the government and uh, the local hospital, uh, the Central Day Salud, and kind of foster relationships there as well. Um, a few years ago, we adopted a slogan, one mission, one team. And when we adopted this, we all wear the same t-shirts and under my scrubs, I have one of these t-shirts um, and the, the local church members wear, wear that t-shirt. And when we run, run a clinic, uh, I think we've had up to 25 volunteers, uh, not working menial jobs, working side by side with us in every aspect of the medical missions, uh, where, the, where is appropriate, and, uh, and just doing a lot. But, but allowing them to step forward and us to step back, um, I think has been the key um, to the blessings that we've received in this growth uh, of the ministries that we're, we've been able to attain there. And this is a very small rural community, but we're moving into the more urban uh, Tekoa. Um, but I, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, I will say the regional growth is a blessing. Not only are we partnering in Honduras, but we've been able to bring in three to four partner churches in the United States, which we plan to work side by side with as, as we move into Tekoa. So, uh, having them partner, the Wisconsin churches partner with uh, Tacoa. we would stay in La Sabita, but yet we overlap and we work together and we share missions together. That's good news, Mike. That's all I have really. I'll, I'll just leave that open for questions or, or during their discussion time if anybody has any questions, but I will say the, the mission and the partnership is has just been a tremendous blessing and, and allowing Orlin and the church to step forward and lead us uh, changed everything. Let's uh, pause there just for a moment while their experience with partnerships fresh. Um, are there any questions that um, you all have for Pastor Orlin or for Mike? Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. Para Orlin, uh, Orlin, uh, uh, cuando, cuando es uh, uh, Iglesia Nueva uh, empieza? ¿Entiende? Cuando? Eh, la Iglesia Nueva aún eh, no comienza porque debido a la pandemia, Sí. Eh, se detuvo el proyecto y vamos a comenzar la construcción del templo en junio de okay. este año. Eh, todavía no hemos reprogramado las fechas para cuándo comenzaríamos la construcción. Todo depende de cómo vaya evolucionando lo que es la pandemia. Es un, es un, es un edificio para la iglesia en, en Tocoa ahora o... Is it Edgar? Does that make sense? Uh, you 
Is there a building there? Es un edificio ahí, ahí, ahí en to Tocoa. Es una iglesia en Tocoa. ¿Tienen algún edificio, Pastor? ¿Tienen? No. ¿Milton? Repítame. Tal vez, tal vez debemos aclarar, estamos hablando de dos comunidades en Tocoa. En la aldea La Seidita, por muchos años hemos tenido templos. Sí. Ahora, el objetivo de la misión es abrir una iglesia en la ciudad. Para esto, gracias a Dios, ya tenemos por las gestiones del pastor, eh, y algunos viajes que dimos allá, ya tenemos el solar para la construcción de la iglesia en Tocúa. Pero debido a la pandemia, la construcción no ha podido empezar. O sea, en Tocúa no hay ninguna estructura. La estructura está en la aldea La Ceidita y ha estado por muchos años, claro que se ha ido mejorando la estructura. Gracias. I will state that while, while there is no building, uh, we were able to get the land donated through our partnership working together with the local community in Tacoa. Uh, the land was donated, we were able to build together Uh, the special needs school on the same property. Uh, so the church and the special needs school will have a, a relationship uh, utilizing each building. Uh, the special needs school will, will, will do devotions daily in the church and the church will be able to use the special needs classrooms for uh, Sunday school, vacation Bible school, those things. So another collaboration and, and partnership. Thank you, Mike. Orlin, gracias. Bueno. I have, I have one question for both of you. Um, over the 11 years that you all have been in partnership, um, how, do you, how do you stay in communication and maintain the relationship uh, between your church leaders, between your churches, in between your actual travel and visits to the country? What, what do you find works the best? Personally, I find um, between our larger missions, I'll, I'll occasionally travel myself or with a small, very small ahead team, we call them an ahead team, and uh, kind of do some of the prep work. I, I think that's very important, that person-to-person -person contact. Uh, otherwise, we use WhatsApp and chat back and forth frequently, very frequently. I think I saw a question from uh, Carrie Lynn Lucas. Um, I'll, it, it, she's asking uh, to Mike how you involve uh, lay people from your church in the relationship. Oh boy. Um, <clears throat> we have large teams um, and we work <clears throat> in, in multiple locations and we not only utilize the translators from the mission, but but Typically, wherever we're working, there will be uh, church members walking side by side with the, uh, with the, with the team members. Uh, so our relationships are, are, have been amazing, frankly. Uh, a little church in a little village, uh, they, they take time off of work. They, they commit to our missions just as we commit to the missions for the time that when we're traveling. And so uh, those relationships are very strong. Um, the, lay, the laity in our church, uh, or the team actually also sponsor kids for school through the Beckus programs. Uh, so we have built relationships through that as well. So um, there's, there's very strong uh, relationships between the church and, and we, truly, we truly are a sister church with La Sabida and, and our church. So Mike, can I ask a follow-up question to your answer? Sure. Uh, I just am curious. So are you finding what I'm hearing in your answer is the, the lay involvement came primarily through travel was the, was the like primary way of getting the interest. And then from there, the investment has come. So you're asking the lay um, people back home, the support back home. Is, is, is that correct? Okay, yeah, so we've involved uh, the church in, in, on a lot of different levels. One is the scholarship. 
Uh, another is very project specific uh, marketing plan, if you will. Uh, when we built a wall around the local school, we had be a brick in the wall. And when we sponsor kids, we have, I think, I think we have about 125 children sponsored through the Beckus program. Uh, and when we go down, we take communication back and forth with us. So uh, we tie people in as much as we can and keep them very involved. And then obviously through our mission um, reports and church services as well. So we've expanded now. Um, I said we added three or four new churches, but I think we actually cross, I would say six or seven churches total uh, supporting us. And we're ecumenical, by the way. Uh, we allow uh, other denominations to join us in our work. Did that answer your question? Um, yeah, it did. I just, you know, the, the thing that I'm noticing with the start of my partnership, it's very pastor to pastor. And so I've been wanting to get some ideas on how to get my lay people at my church involved. So that's helpful. Thank you. Sure. I see uh, uh, Mike Lish has put a question uh, in the chat. Um, Mike, do you want to just speak to your question? I think that was actually Jason. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very good, Jason. Right. <laughs> okay. Still shows up as Prosper UMC. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you are. Uh, sorry, multitasking over here. Um. So, Mike, as I was listening in, I I was I got really excited about the impact, obviously, that you guys have had to ha had an opportunity to do over the eleven years. But we're just getting started, and so I'm just. I'm thinking about how much this needs to be a relationship and not just one directional. And so to create a strong base, if you were starting over again, what are, what are those absolutes? What are the things that you would say, this needs to happen to be able to get this started right? You know, that is a great question. Um, I, I think building that relationship uh, the pastor to pastor relationship and a level of trust. I think um, just getting people on the ground and, and relating, getting into the community, uh, more so than just within the church, getting into the homes, uh, visiting, kind of learning the area and, and expanding your mission way beyond the church walls and way beyond the Methodist congregation and, and making those connections in the local government. That was huge and, and the local school. Uh, the principal and I became very good friends, and unfortunately, he just passed away from COVID this year. Um, so we have a great relationship in the school. We go everywhere. We go to the Central Day Salute. We go to the hospital. Uh, and I think just establishing those early relationships is so important. But then as soon as you do that, I think stepping back a little bit and making sure that, that what we say, coming in low, that, that you're coming in you know, with, with the attitude of a servant leadership and, and deferring to the locals and the local church, I think is so important and establishing that trust with the church in that regards that you're not coming in like we do, you know, heavy with all of our ideas and plans and, you know, not that we don't do that still, <laughs> but we do it more subtly and gently maybe. <laughs> I hope that's helpful. It is. Thanks, Mike. We have a, uh, another a person on the call who I think is uh, sharing some wisdom um, in the chat in response to uh, Jason, your question. So, uh, Adi, do you want to you want to share uh, what you wrote in the chat or? Sure, I'd be happy to. Hi, my name's Dee, and I'm in um, the West Ohio Conference. So we don't have an official partnership with Honduras yet. Um, we have had some other partnerships. And so one of the ways that we've been able to get laity engaged, both from our congregations and congregations on the ground, is um, just using um, actually sometimes simple technology, um, whether it was Skype, Zoom, or WhatsApp. Um, we've had um, small groups who have done Bible study. We've had prayer meetings together. Um, and when you're praying, you don't it's like you don't have to you don't have to all speak the same language right it's like you know there's somebody that would kind of like share that but it's like you know being able to pray together um and so we really um many of our places um particularly in the volga district in russia that's how we got started 
We had youth group to youth group um, relationships and partnerships um, that got developed and started that way as well. And so we never, particularly with the Volga District Partnership, um, we never really started with projects and we didn't start with money. It was really building that relationship um, with each other. Um, and uh, I mean, our congregations and they're in West Ohio, they're in rural areas and urban areas um, who are connected. And there's just as a strong, um, just a strong relationship. And so there's just been a lot, it's been rooted in, in relationship. And so it's not mattered when um, the clergy have changed in our congregations because it wasn't it wasn't rooted in the personality of the pastor so it was really was the laity to laity so those were just some things that that we've done um, for for what it might be worth great thanks d and good to see you at first church uh in oak ridge tennessee we started up the program with laity in 2003 since that point, we have sent out 73 mission trips and mission teams into the world, and it's been all laity. Once in a while, we can beg one of our pastors to go with us, but 80% of the time, we don't even have a pastor with us, so it has been all laity driven. That's great. All right, I want to be sure we get an opportunity to hear from Sherry Hunt as well. Uh, Sherry, thanks for being with us on the call today. And Sherry's going to share a little bit about her and her church's experience with uh, partnership. Hi, uh, so I'm Sherry. Uh, I am at Morning Star Church. We are just outside of St. Louis, Missouri. And um, our church has been going to La Hagua. Um, the La Hagua area since 2004. Um, I haven't been here that long, but they've had a long partnership going. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how our partnership has evolved. Um, we don't have the benefit of a strong technological connection ability um, because where our partners are, they don't really have internet access. Um, they don't always have electricity. So um, we've had to be a little bit more creative um, Mostly, I just email Milton and beg him and say, hey, <laughs> can, I, can I talk to somebody? Because I can't get in touch with um, anybody. And he works very, very hard to get in touch with um, the pastor of our church, uh, Pastor Marvin. Um, so some things that we've done in the past that didn't work as well that we have shifted on. Um, we had tried to do uh, community water systems to help with clean water. Um, which was great initially, but then discovered that the maintenance and upkeep was problematic because things would break and they didn't have a way to fix it. They'd have to wait on us. And so it wasn't sustainable. Um, same with sewing ministry. We tried that, um, but then things would break and they didn't have a way to fix it. And we didn't really know anything about the market. Um, making and selling things in St. Louis, Missouri is very different than making and selling things in La Hagua, Honduras. <laughs> um, and so we learned that the hard way, but we, what really changed for us um, in 2017, we sent a small team, it was just actually me and two other people, um, to just, it was just a listening trip. We didn't plan any ministry activities at all. Uh, we just went and listened. Um, and we spent a good bit of time with our partner church. Uh, we also got to travel to, I think we got to talk to about 17 different pastors. Um, we just did a tour of Honduras and talked to as many as we could and asked what has worked well, what hasn't worked well, what do you wish that teams knew when they came to Honduras. Um, we also just asked what are the needs of your community? What do you love about your community? What makes you love living here? Um, so that we could learn as much as possible. And um, the phrase that we really took back from that was put your plan in your pocket. Um, one of the pastors said that to us and we've kind of adopted that of, yes, we want to have a plan, but we also recognize that Honduran pastors know their Honduran congregations and communities much better than we do. Um, and so all of our prep work is in vain if it's not actually what the community needs. So that's kind of been our approach. Um, since then, 
And we, like I said, technology isn't uh, a luxury that we have with our partner church, but when we are there, um, we have some really intentional conversations where we just sit down with pen and paper and say, okay, what are your hopes and dreams for your church? How can we support you? What would you like to see from us? Um, and it's been really, really cool to see that grow. Um, Pastor Marvin does an amazing job at ministering to his community, so we are thrilled to get to support him. Um, and one, a couple of cool things that we've been able to do through that, um, because of not having the ability to talk to him all the time. Um, this summer, actually, he needed his um, bike replaced. Um, he pastors two congregations, one in the Hagua and one in Esquapa, and is going back and forth. So having a bike is very, very necessary. And it, it needed um, repair or replacement. And so what we did is we actually, our children's ministry raised the money for that, um, just as a way to continually connect the church um, and to teach our kids about it, which is great. And we are also, we had planned this summer to do uh, some kids ministry training when we were there. So kind of getting to say, hey, look at what these kids are doing here because they love you. And um, so that was a really cool thing. We have also, um, we've done this once and we plan to do it again because we do a lot of medical clinics, um, hired teams in Honduras when we're not able to go. Um, so we've hired Honduran doctors and pharmacists, and we always work with Honduran pharmacists when we go, but just hired them to say, we have not forgotten about you just because we're not there. Um, especially right now, that's really important. Um, and where our churches are, um, they don't really have great access to medical care, so it's extra important. Um, so that's been kind of a unique approach where um, when we first did that, there were some people in our church that really had a problem with it. And I think it came down to um, a little bit of pride of it's not about us being there, um, but it's about the relationship and the work and making sure that people are being taken care of and making sure that their needs are met. Um, and the, the last thing I wanted to, to briefly mention, um, just asking questions has been huge for us. Um, our last trip, we were able to do an eye clinic for the first time. And that started because we were talking about what needs does your church have? Um, and then he said, well, training is a big issue. And we said, okay, why? Um, and he said, well, literacy is a really big issue that, you know, it's hard to, when we bring over training materials, well, if you can't read them, they're not useful. Um, and so we started looking at the challenges uh, facing literacy. And one of the things he said was, well, a lot of people can't see, they don't have proper eye care. Um, and so we said, okay, let's start there. Um, kind of with the intention of, we're not looking to have a really exciting, fun, one week thing. We want to have lasting impact in the community um, and meet needs that are going to carry on, um, not just to be like the fun party bus for a week, <laughs> um, but to really help where the need is, um, knowing that there's going to be things that it takes a long time for us to see the results of, and that's okay, because it's not about us. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot of cool things that we've been able to do. Um, we've been able to learn a lot from Pastor Marvin and the way that he takes care of his congregation, um, because ministry is tough no matter where you are. <laughs> so uh, getting to learn from him has been really great. Um, but yeah, those, those are kind of the highlights of our, of our partnership. And I hope I didn't talk too fast. <laughs> You can ask Milton that. He's the one trying to translate in Spanish on the chat. <laughs> uh, Sherry, thank you. And again, uh, we want to pause for any questions, any follow-up questions that any of you have for Sherry. Uh, Chair, I just want to say I appreciate um, just your transparency about the learning journey that your church has been on in this partnership and the lessons y'all have learned. I love that phrase, put your plan in your pocket. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> A good reminder. Okay. Well, um, so we, we have about 20 minutes left. 
Uh, we want to reserve some time at the end for Pastor Roberto to share a closing uh, devotional word for us. Uh, I believe that was on the uh, on the agenda, and so uh, with the with the minutes in between, I just want to uh, share a couple of things about um, these church to church partnerships. Uh, the General Board of Global Ministries uh, puts these kinds of partnerships under the banner of in mission together. You may have heard that phrase today, uh, IMT, and basically that's. Uh, GBGM's way of um, describing these relationships, uh, these partnerships as ones based on relationship um, in a spirit of mutuality and empower empowerment, um, the way that you've described, that you heard people describe them today. Um, so from a, a North Texas uh, conference point of view, um, I, have, I guess fun news to share. Um, and that is that we um, are adding, depending on how you count it, um, as of now, two to four new uh, U.S. partners to the mix. Um, First United Methodist Church of Denton has agreed uh, to be a partner church, and uh, they're in the process of discerning um, which church they're feeling called to partner with uh, that doesn't already have a partner, um, but they're definitely supportive. And something exciting about um, that particular opportunity is that First Denton has a, a Latinx congregation that's a part of them. And so, uh, so that just adds some richness to the, the partnership and the relationships that will happen there. And then um, the second, is from uh, St. Andrew United Methodist Church in Plano. Uh, they're, they're one of our uh, larger churches in terms of size in the North Texas Conference. And so they have signed on <laughs> to partner with three congregations. Um, and uh, it looks like they'd like to partner with Don Lee Central and um, Fuente de la Luz, also in that Don Lee area. And then uh, obviously, with the guidance of the mission, would be interested in helping to plant um, another church that could be a satellite there uh, in Don Lee. So, um, again, depending on how you count it, we have two to four new partners um, to celebrate and, and others that are in the works. Um, I know when, when I visited uh, a year and a half ago and we began um, laying, some, laying the foundation for these church-to-church -church partnerships um, in North Texas, we, we dreamed about a goal of, at, by the end of 2020 of uh, identifying a, a U.S. partner for every congregation uh, in Honduras. And I think we're really close now, which is really exciting. And again, um, we give thanks to God for the way God's working in the midst of this uh, partnership, not just in North Texas, but um, in the United Methodist Church um, all around. So those are just some celebrations, um, and many of other of our North Texas partners are on the call uh, today as well. So um, I, I wanted to, with just a yeah, couple of minutes that I have left before I turn it over to uh, Pastor Roberto. Um, so uh, let's see, I want to share my screen and just point you to something. Let's see if I can pull it up. Here it is. So uh, this is a, a mission together uh, you know, document, uh, a covenant that uh, in North Texas we've developed, uh, kind of adapting something that came from GBGM. And it, it begins by laying out some of the values um, that make for a healthy covenant relationship. And our, the, the examples we've heard illustrate those values uh, beautifully. Um, but here's another way to put it in writing. And then um, <clears throat> it basically lays out some, what we hope would be expectations for a healthy partnership um, with communication and gives some ideas and examples for how to communicate and also um, things to do when having those uh, virtual um, times of getting together. And then um, it describes uh, 
some of the, the financial pieces uh, to the partnership. I know we've learned as we've listened to the mission that uh, finan the financial part of the partnership is is a, a potential pitfall, and it's a it's a uh, in a way to inadvertently um, just sort of get that relationship uh, a little wrong. And so try to be real careful to say here are the good best ways to go about that part of the partnership, um, and just some of the nuts and bolts for how to live into that. So. I just wanted you to see this, uh, North Texas folks, but really for all of our U.S. partners, so that um, you you know are aware it's a resource that is available to you. If you think it'd be helpful um, it, to share with others, kind of what this partnership can look like, um, or if you're inviting others uh, to consider uh, being a part of a, of a church to church partnership, again, this is a, a resource that I'd be happy to uh, to share. Um, in conversations with other uh, IMT coordinators recently um, in other parts of the world, we had this discussion about the role of a covenant. And it was really interesting. In some contexts, having a covenant up front that spells out the nature of the relationship was really crucial. It was appreciated. It was needed. Um, in other contexts, they said, it, to use the words we heard earlier, it's okay to begin with that, but keep it in your pocket. Um, and just live into it, knowing it's there. Um, but you know, don't rush into getting everything in writing because that's a great way to sort of squelch the spirit of relationship that um, you know we're trying to nurture. So again, I, I offer that resource, but offer it um, you know with those caveats and sort of hold it loosely. <laughs> um, but it does give give us a helpful direction to move in. And again, I'm happy to. Happy to share that with you if you're interested. All right. Um, so again, one last time for questions. Are there any uh, questions from folks on the call about um, about these church to church partnerships, about our relationship with the mission in Honduras? Um, I have just one more question. Sorry if I'm the person that dominates today. Um, I'm curious with so many pastors that are in the ordination process in the Honduran church, um, if there's anything from our end, like my partner church pastor is um, in process, but is there anything um, that folks at the mission could advise or any of the pastors on here as to how we can um, be a helpful resource to our pastors going through that process um, other than just like general, like, cheerleading for them? So, hey, can I answer this question? I think that Amy Spar, who is our Board of Ordain Ministry rep from North Texas, probably is the one to have that conversation. Do you, Andy, do you, do you think? So if you want- and Amy's on the call. I, I am on the call and I'd be happy to talk with you, Carolyn. Awesome. I did see we had one other question in the chat um, from Lauren Eichler, who's from uh, Prosper UMC. And she asked, just curious to learn more about how your church was able to hire locally in Honduras when your congregation wasn't able to travel. Just would love any learnings you can share about that process. So Sherry? Uh, yeah, so honestly, Milton probably did most of the work on that. <laughs> We kind of just reached out to him and said, you know, what can we do? How much is it going to cost? Um, we try really hard to keep track of medications. And when we do our medical clinics, we keep records so that we kind of have a guess of how much we'll need. Um, and we have um, awesome pharmacists that you saw in the slides about staff um, that do most of that as well and do a really good job of knowing the medications and amounts that we need. Um, so yeah, that's the main, um, not to like add to your plate, but my main advice is just ask Milton. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we've done that. Um, we did that a year ago because we just weren't able to send a team. And then we were supposed to go this July and obviously we couldn't um, and are working on send, hiring um, to replace the trip that we were supposed to take this summer um, with potentially having to do that next year as well. Awesome. That's helpful. Thank you so much. Andy, Andy, 
I'm going to have to leave for the next appointment. I just wanted to, I wanted to thank everybody. I ch said something in the chat. I especially want to say gracias por uh, uh, Superintendente Roberto para su tra uh, trabajando. Uh, uh, we appreciate you very much, Roberto. Gracias. Thank you. Well, we will talk soon. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, Andy. Thank all of you. Yes, my pleasure. All right, so I think uh, as we wrap up our time together, um, I wanna uh, step aside and, uh, and ask uh, Pastor Roberto to share a, a closing word with us. Yeah. Expreso mi gratitud también a Andy, a Milton, y a todos los que se involucraron en la organización. I want to express my appreciation to Andy and everyone that um, took the time to put this together. Um, el hermano Mike Craig hizo alusión a una camiseta. A una camiseta. Mike Craig mentioned something about una camiseta, una t-shirt. T-shirt. En el día de ayer utilizaba, usaba yo una camiseta que me fue regalada. Por un grupo. And yesterday, I was using um, a t-shirt that was also given by a team. Hace muchos años, y no recuerdo qué grupo fue. Many years ago, I do not even remember what team that was. Pero la camiseta tiene un texto pequeño que dice, trabajando juntos para construir un fundamento sólido. But the t-shirt says, um, working together to... Um, ¿Veo? obtain a solid foundation. Y esa ha sido la experiencia vivida en Honduras. And that has been my experience um, that I've lived in Honduras. A través de las iglesias, del compañerismo con iglesias norteamericanas. Throughout the churches and the partnership with the churches. Desde el mismo comienzo con el Consejo de Iglesias Evangélicas Metodistas de América From the Latina. very beginning with the um, uh, evangelical Methodist churches. Con la uh, Iglesia Metodista del Caribe y las Américas. With the Methodist Church of the Caribbean and the Americas. Con iglesias autónomas de América uh, Latina. With autonomous churches in Latin America. Eh, así que el fundamento ha sido construido en una forma sólida. So the foundation indeed has been built in a very solid way. Quiero compartir algunos versículos de Primera de Corintios, capítulo 3. And I want to share uh, some verses from 1 Corinthians, chapter 3. Versos 7 al Verses 7 to 11. Así que ni el que planta es algo... Ni el que riega, sino Dios que da el crecimiento. Y el que planta y el que riega son una misma cosa, aunque cada uno recibirá su recompensa conforme a su labor. Pero nosotros somos colaboradores de Dios, y vosotros sois labranza de Dios, edificio de Dios. Conforme a la gracia de Dios, me ha sido dada yo como perito arquitecto. Usa el fundamento y otro edifica encima, pero cada uno mire cómo sobre edifica, porque nadie puede poner otro fundamento que el que está puesto, el cual es Jesucristo. Precisamente porque el fundamento ha sido Jesucristo, se ha logrado. So because the foundation has been Jesus Christ, ha sido posible la unidad. It has been possible to get this unity. Unidad que se, se sigue cultivando en el día de hoy. Unity that continues to flourish up to today. Con esta experiencia que hemos tenido en, en, en la tarde de hoy. And especially with this experience that we've uh, had this afternoon. Cuando estamos fundamentados en Cristo se produce la unidad. So when we're founded on Jesus Christ, that's when it produces unity. En las Escrituras tenemos varias Imágenes de la iglesia. And so in the Bible we have uh, different images of the churches. 
en, en estos versículos de Primera de Corintios tenemos la idea de una planta, pero también de un edificio. In this um, passage uh, in Corinthians, we have the image of a plant and the image of a building. Asimismo, en Primera de Corintios 12, nos vuelve a mostrar lo esencial de la unidad y de la contribución de cada cual. And like that, it also mentions in uh, 1 Corinthians 12 about the unity. Y eso ha estado sucediendo en Honduras. And that's what we, has been happening in Honduras. Cada cual contribuyendo al Everyone gives a little bit to the, the foundation. La misión, pudiéramos decir que ya está bien fundamentada. And we can say that the mission has been well founded. Pero para continuar creciendo, necesitamos, necesitamos continuar cultivando esa unidad. But in order to continue to grow, we need to continue to water um, the foundation. En la imagen que nos presenta eh, también de un cuerpo en Primera de Corintios 12. Also in 1 Corinthians 12, it represents a body. Nos... Eh, resalta que todos somos importantes. And it says that we are all important. Somos necesarios. We're all um, needed or necessary. Y debemos funcionar en forma interdependiente. And that we need to function also in a very independent way. Pudiéramos decir que en Honduras y en la misión. We can muchas. say that in Honduras and in the mission. Muchas necesidades que son reales. There are a lot of needs that are uh, real. Pero también hay mucha riqueza que compartir. But there is also a lot of richness that we can share. Yo no soy hondureño, pero como ya se dijo anteriormente, hace más de 20 años que estoy en relación con la misión. I'm not Honduran, but um, as we said earlier, uh, it's been 20 years in relationship with the mission. Y ha sido una experiencia de, de, de crecimiento y de bendición para mi vida. And it has been a real blessing for me to see the involvement of the blessing of the mission. Así que continuemos en ese mismo espíritu de unidad. So let's continue to remain um, in that spirit of unity. Trabajando juntos. Working together. Para seguir edificando el reino de Dios a través de la misión de Honduras. So that we can continue to work for um, the God's kingdom through the mission in Honduras. Iniciamos con una oración por el obispo, Michael Maki. So we started with the prayer from uh, the bishop, Michael Maki. Y yo quisiera que termináramos con una oración dirigido por el reverendo Edgar Avitia. And I would like that we can close uh, this session with a prayer from uh, Reverend Avitia. En los últimos años, pues, ha sido también pieza clave en el desarrollo de la misión. Who has been, um, in the past years, um, fundamental and important key for the mission. Edgar, si nos puede dirigir en oración, puede ser en inglés. Porque Jorlen puede entender, yo puedo entender, y creo que Orlin también puede entender bastante. So Hablando please do no. it in Spanish or English, it doesn't matter because all the uh, Spanish speaking people might be able to understand. <laughs> Gracias a todos y que la bendición de Dios sea sobre cada uno de nosotros. Thank you everyone and may the Lord bless you. Edgar, por favor. Let's pray. Let us pray. Desde, nuestra, desde nuestras fibras más íntimas elevamos una plegaria al trono de tu gracia, Señor. We thank you for your blessings uh, from our, our most inner self. And we elevate, we bring uh, for a prayer of, of in, in the spirit of gratitude for you being uh, 
with us through all the years as in in this um, work in Honduras, Lord. We thank you for allowing us to collaborate with you in the advancement of your kingdom. I thank you for each and every one of my sisters and my brothers here present. Um, we we go way back uh, with, with some of them. Some of them um, been walking with the mission for from the very beginning, um, a systematic uh, way and with the scene to faithfulness and commitment to the kingdom. And we thank you for for uh, your blessings and it's been a tough year to say the least, but you've been faithful. And we, we praise you for that. I thank you for the, the, the efforts uh, of all my colleagues, uh, my sisters and my brothers in Honduras, and uh, uh, they struggle with the pandemic uh, in, in a very complex context as, as it is. And I, I thank you for their faithfulness to serve um, bringing bringing uh, hope in, in in concrete ways, and I thank you, God, for for all the learnings that that they have also been open uh, to to acquire uh, walking together, um, zooming together, <laughs> just sharing good some faith and, and love and i thank you for, for all this all this year in tough year and we we seek your blessing the blessing of each and every one of us our ministries uh, our churches and uh, seek you the blessing of our relationship thank you god for this opportunity to gather together gracias señor bendícenos llévanos adelante Te lo pedimos en Cristo. Amén. 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 Thanks, everyone. Um, I will follow up uh, by email with resources uh, from today's summit. I appreciate each of you for your, as Edgar said, your ministry and your partnership, and look forward to uh, staying in touch and communication. So God bless you. Have a great afternoon.